now with Arduinos and Raspberry Pis, if A won't talk to B, they jolly well will if you stick a Raspberry Pi in the middle of them. Just write a bit of software to convert that to that. And of course, such is the performance of this modern hardware now, and such is the range of its networking capability, that you can do huge amounts. You're not compromising the overall quality of the chain in any way. I mean, you know, your Raspberry Pi solutions are really very, very good. So what did we do in the old days if hardware A wouldn't talk to hardware B? Or it could even be that software A produced by some machine had to be converted into another software standard for some other machine. So whatever. I think my introduction to all this back in the day was when we at Nottingham decided to follow in the footsteps of Bell Labs, have our own typesetter. We couldn't do it exactly the same way that Bell Labs did, otherwise we'd have been in court before we knew where we were. But it turned out that in the gap between Bell Labs doing it in about 1979, 1980 and us doing it in about 1983, that things had come on with this particular typesetter. Now, we're back in the era that, yes, laser printers had been invented. They were there at Xerox Park. HP knew all about it. It was a technology waiting to happen, but it hadn't quite happened yet. And in the very early 80s, if you wanted to be an early adopter of a laser printer, you'd be paying maybe 15 grand for resolution that was maybe only 300 lines to the inch. So typical early adopter problem. Yes, it's the future, but the standard of it isn't fabulous at the moment and it's darn expensive for what it is. And this was why we were caught when deciding which kind of typesetter we wanted. And part of me was saying, should we wait another couple of years, three years maybe, for you know, laser printed technology to improve sufficiently and the people doing the project with me, principally George, the maths consultant who wanted to typeset beautiful maths papers now, we were in the daft position that we had to adopt old technology to bridge the gap. We were sold the future for our types and they said this 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 Omnitech is wonderful. It uses laser technology. It was a very early very high quality laser printer, but it's an example of don't let the wrong industry invent the future because they'll get it wrong. What they were obsessed by was that traditional typesetting going all the way back to hot metal and then coming forward, if you remember, through characters as film strips, characters as on an ultra high definition cathode ray tube, yeah? Our customers will not accept anything less than 970 dots to the inch. But when this laser technology started to be developed by Merg and Thaler, they found that really it was happiest at 300 dpi. And you can imagine our oh, customers will not accept 300 dpi, so we must drive this technology to the limits. What they ended up doing was having ultra finely divided toner ink and special glossy paper that you had to use, not ordinary A4 or US letter out of a packet, oh no. Have, have you got some of that? What, some of the... the paper? Yes. Should we have a quick look? Is it possible to... Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll, shall I bring it in? Yes, this is the actual paper output everything from the Omnitech, and it is a bit of descriptive prose about the Omnitech, you see, which is all very useful. And when you rub your finger over here, very glossy finish and if everything was working and set up beautifully it was actually a really rather commendable effect and they claimed her to get 720 dots per inch and even that was just all oh, some of our customers won't like it because the 202 using the previous generation technology could get 972 dots per inch so we're compromising our standards already but they couldn't drive it any higher than 720 even then it was a nightmare. It was like, I always thought of it as being rather like owning a very, very, very expensive car, like a, oh, I don't know, a Bugatti or a Doosan, but something really way out that is fine, but it needs a complete strip down and total service after every hundred miles of usage. This was the same. We found that ideally it was happiest if it was cleaned and totally stripped down and, and done at the end of every day, ready for the next day, you know? 
And it was just, as a, and it wasn't just us, it was customers in America and so on reported exactly the same problems. So we had to give up on the Omnitech and we had to go back a generation. We had to ask uh, Linotype to supply us with a Linotronic 202 which we've also talked about in the past, previous generation, because it had a high resolution cathode ray tube inside it. It was slow, but it was good. produced good quality output, but it was on bromide film or bromide paper. It needed developing, it needed fixing, all of that hassle. But we did it and it worked absolutely fine. So I hear you say, but you were driving these things not with uh, Linotype's own software, you of course were using Unix TROF and EQN because this was even just before Donkness Tech. It was happening just about the same time as this. But actually this was about a year or 18 months before it. So we used Brian Kernigan's EQN for typesetting and mathematics equations. Everything was hunky-dory, but there was I, the manager of the project, thinking all of this TROF typesetting stuff is happening on the PDP-1144, which we bought for use by the exams department when we eventually hand it over. Because all this, I remember this, we said this in the last video, which was a few years ago, but it, you were trying to typeset the, the exam papers. Yes, we were trying to typeset all the exam papers for the University of Nottingham because we were being charged by outside typeset companies £18,000 a year. They ignored the dead easy English and history papers, which were perfectly straightforward. They concentrated on my dear friend George's mathematics papers, of which there were lots, which they started rubbing their hands and saying, oh, this is a job for a professional. I can feel sums of money like £10 a page coming here, you know, and all this kind of stuff. So, yes, that's what we were trying to do. But, and in the end, we did succeed. But one of the bigger problems was that either of those typesetters, the Omnitech or the 202, wanted to live in a world of everything being done the Mergenthaler liner type way. In other words, you didn't go to outside suppliers for terminals. You used a Cora text preparation terminal supplied by Mergenthaler liner type. Everything was like a special build for the particular community that it was in. The era of generic machines and PCs was, wasn't far away, but it wasn't quite there. So we were very non-standard. Those typesetters wanted their input down a parallel port. Now, some of you older types out there will know that there's a printer parallel port on old-fashioned PCs. But back in this era, there was no compatibility about how your parallel ports work. So what you're doing basically, instead of sending eight bits of a character, bang, 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 eight of them serially, you presented them on eight parallel wires. That's all you're doing. So in principle, you make it eight times faster because when you say send, you're sending eight times as much information. Problem is, as many of you know, you only need that parallel cable, which has to be wide enough now to maybe be 16 wide to take eight bits going in and a reply of eight bits coming back. Ribbon cable twisted, differential timings on the different bits in your character because somebody's trodden on the cable. Uh, it, it's not an easy technology. And it always struck me as very significant that they did not develop the universal parallel bus to be high speed. No, USB serial is so much easier to cope with. And the answer to go faster is make the dead easy protocol serial go faster. Don't mess about with parallel. But we were there, we had to mess with parallel. I was stuck there with two different specs for two different parallel interfaces to linotype machines. One had been developed in America, one had been developed in the UK, and of course they were completely different. So what you did in those days, no Raspberry Pi, I got a guy called Steve Marchant, excellent hardware engineer in our computing center, to put me together a box running a Z80 chip. It's coming out of the PDP-11 and it's got the final, if you like, raw, characters with some control characters that are to be sent to the typesetters to tell them to either change font, change spacing, or just typeset the letter A, wherever you are at the moment. So all of those things, but they had to go in on this parallel port. So I had to develop the software on a single board Z80 that 
took that serial stream, parceled it up into 8-bit parallel characters, Exeter, you know, in a wider buffer, ready to go, and sent them through the parallel port to either the Omnitech initially, but latterly the Lana Type 202. You send off your 8 bits, you then poll the interface and say, are you ready, did you get that? And it comes back and says, ready. So you're waiting all the time, is it ready for the next character? But it worked. Now the thing for me in that era was, yes, you had to have a hardware person to design that interface for you, serial in, parallel out. The thing that I thought, well, this is great because I discovered I could just get away with it. I thought, will I have to write that stuff in that PROM chip, which I'm going to burn? I'll have to do that in assembler somewhere, won't I, and burn it? No. Fortunately, there was a thing called the Whitesmiths C compiler developed by a team at Queen Mary College, University of London, I think, and I was delighted to have it because they had got a C to Z80 compiler. But that was running on the PDP 1144. So it's an example of a cross compiler. It's not compiling code for PDP deck stuff for use on this machine. It's compiling code for a foreign thing called a Z80 chip, which will go down a serial line and end up being burnt onto a PROM to run in that board. And even for relatively Everyday things I was doing, like wait for the character to come in, is it ready, pull the interface, send off the next character, was that okay? Even for simple routine things like that, I found it such a relief to be able to write in C and not... I mean, I'm not Ken Thompson. We are not talking about writing a whole operating system. But believe me, just the ability to write that simple interfacing program in C not in assembler made the world a difference to me. But I, it just made me, coming back again, reflect. That was the sort of level of, of effort you had to put into interfacing foreign kit that didn't want to speak to each other. Did you have to test it on the actual kit or did you have a, a simulator? No, I didn't have a, have a simulator, which was why I had to explain to the examinations departments that had just shelled out the best part of £35,000 for the line of Type 202. I said, I'm sorry, and you, you will think this is us taking it over, but I need six weeks to commission this thing. I'm not Ken Thompson, Steve Marchant's not Joe Conlon, I don't know. No, even they took six weeks for their project, which was arguably rather harder than what we did. I said, we need several weeks to commission this, because when we are trying its interface saying how fast are we likely to be able to feed these characters at it because it's going to come back and say you've got to wait for the ready and the answer was it was comfortingly slow I didn't have any timing problems to worry about and it went plod 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 and by the end of 84 we really had using the 202 typeset the complete uh, University of Nottingham's papers, all of them, for the very first time in-house. What then happened, perhaps to complete the story, is that after doing that for two years, even George, my consultant, said, you know, these are only exam papers. I do wonder if people would find them acceptable to just have them done on this new 300 dots per inch laser printer. Maybe people won't mind. Most people never noticed, you know. It was using Times Roman, the math symbols were there. The fact that it was a bit grainy compared to the super duper bromide, most people didn't care for, for that sort of thing. And that's an example of how if you're wedded into a high quality industry, you find it incomprehensible that the great unwashed will accept a lesser quality than you do. But of course, that rules the world in a sense. I mean, laser printers are more like 600 DPI now, aren't they? So was that switching, when you mentioned that, that was switching to the laser, the Apple laser writer? Yes, it's actually saying, well, we've had the, um, the Linotronic 202. Thanks, Linotronic, you're a great machine. They still continue to use it for very high quality jobs but frankly for the grunt work which was getting the exam papers done people thought it was a miracle they they would cheerfully vote for lots and lots more 300 dpi and do everything like that than wait a bit longer and get an even smoother looking version of an exam paper uh, so i learned a lot from that really about 
what level of technology do you really need and what do your customers really want even though one or two of our number might have thought it to be how should we say abominable that they had such low standards never mind that's what we need that's what we use it's been a, i think it's been the death of many a specialist industry the idea of it's good enough it's like every car needs to be a rolls royce customers for cars won't accept anything less until a model t comes along and they're initially deprecated but then quietly people by them say oh well for what i use it for it's good enough you know so an executable binary the net effect of slotting that T diagram against here slightly downwards is to show you that the C you've written gets converted into binary and the net output from this process, it produces out a program that you probably store in a...